Volker Hermes is a painter from Dusseldorf who trained in the city's art academy. He's been painting for over 20 years, and during that time his work has been exhibited in many galleries around the world. But it was during the COVID lockdowns that it began to receive particular attention, with his hidden portrait series of photocollage becoming an internet sensation. As the result of an article in Italian Vogue magazine, interview requests came from Moscow, London, Chile, South Africa, Poland, Belgium and Brazil, as well as a collaboration with Christie's. I interviewed Volker at his exhibition Rough Hood at London's James Freeman Gallery. Being a painter doesn't only mean being in the street alone. You are really in a kind of social context. And this social context is really affecting your work. Because you are dealing with people, you are dealing with society, you want to answer something about society. And I thought that this was always the case. And I started to look at historical works in the sense that what wants a society of artists? Why were all these people portrayed in these very, very glamorous ways? What are the claims? So this was the thought in the beginning. I thought there must be some, there must, there must be messages in this works. And looking at all these works, I figured out that there are plenty of messages, that these works are really, they're trying to talk to us, but we don't know the vocabulary. Because all these codes, all these things that are holding their hands, all these clothes, were very common and everybody knew about it at that time. But we are living in a completely different society. And I decided that I don't want to paint them because I definitely don't want to imitate the historical arts. And I think I taught myself Photoshop. And then I tried to play, if you put away one of those, like the face, this is a kind of major irritation. But this irritation brings up a completely new approach because all the other things are getting into focus. And this is more or less how it started. That's so interesting because. You know, when, when we look at portraits, and most of your work, and I think all of your work, is, is about portraiture, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, the first thing we look at is the face to um, to work out the identity. I mean, as art historians, we learn to look at other things as well. Because obviously, you know, we, we think about, well, you know, what's important about the costume, or about the jewellery this person is wearing. But as a, as a general viewer, when you go into a gallery, I think the first thing you look at is the face and the eyes. And okay, in this photograph, we see the eyes. Yeah, I mean, this is a kind of really like a state portrait. Yeah. You see this really glamorous uh, armor, and you see this rock. They are getting bigger and bigger yeah. because they show the, the rank in, the, in society. Yeah. And I this and yeah, let him drown in, in this rock. And it's rough, but, but also there's this fabulous coat of armor here. And that would have been incredibly important. I mean, I think that's what's so brilliant about uh, not just focusing on his face is that I, I would think a painting like this is all about showing us this really beautiful armor, which would have been incredibly expensive, probably been the most expensive thing this man owned, I would say. Yeah. And here he's, he's wearing the collar of the golden fleece, which again was a sign of very high status. It was to be in the entourage of the Habsburg emperors. It's really spectacular. And I don't think anybody would have owned a suit of armor that looks like this. So the suit of armor itself is fantastic, yeah. isn't it? But what I thought is like, it's, it's a kind of young guy. And he's, uh, I mean, he was very, very pretty, but also kind of trapped in this, in this yeah. whole thing that he had to do. And seeing this armor, with all these ornaments and these figures, I tried to make it kind of playful. It's also very poignant, isn't it? Because it's very young. I mean, almost a boy, if you look at his hair, his hair is almost like baby hair. You know, you imagine he's almost hiding behind his armor. So yeah. what you do is really bring that up and make us really think about that. You know, the fear that you must feel inside of all, all of this. Yeah, and, and I think for me, it's, it's important that, that we get a really feeling about this situation that he was in yeah. from our contemporary life, this kind of armor. In a kind of early age, yeah. this is definitely not fun. No, no, absolutely. And this is a sort of a Rembrandt portrait, yeah. is that right? And this time, you know, the graph is absolutely, it's almost suffocating, isn't it? 
Yeah, it was almost, it was very difficult to eat. And they had to invent kind of huge spoons to uh, get over it and to eat. It was kind of complicated to be rich, right? And in that time, it was very big, it's black clothes, it's black and black, because it was very, very expensive. But they had these Calvinistic societies, they had these kind of rules, okay, keep it simple. Yes. They had to wear kind of simple, of, of course, expensive, but simple looking clothes. And all the ways they could show their wealth, they did. Their individuality back behind these surfaces. Yeah. So you see that this is not an ordinary black dress. It's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's a small, small part of the society who could afford this. And of course, they could afford a rapper. And he was the most expensive artist of his time. Uh, yes. It's really negative to think about all those things in a way that we wouldn't if we were just focused on the face. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Just moving along, I've always felt that there's a little bit of a play on bondage going on here, which is very bizarre. Also, these costumes are very fetishistic. I mean, her waist, if you look at that one there, her waist is up 20 centimeters in the circumference. I mean, it's tiny. Yeah, I mean, I think it was really hard for her to sit. Yeah. And of course, she had no choice. Yeah. And this being trapped and covered by this fabric, we get this information better when we get this kind of mask. Yeah. 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 And so this is kind of transformation into our discussion. Yes. And of course, she had both this. And you know, yesterday at the opening, we had this cousin, and I said, I'm sure that she insisted, I don't want to be here with the book, at least with the book. Yeah. At least, because I'm smart, because I'm educated. Maybe she could have read the book, but yeah. Take an hour. Yeah, can you understand a bit uh, about this um, attributes? Then you have a kind of toolbox and you can go anywhere and see this work completely different. Right. Yes, a number of your works are of women, and I think to me it says something about also the subjugation of women and the loss of identity. They're just a mask of beauty. Yeah, I want to point on the fact that her individuality was not so important uh, while, while they were painted. It was her status and her position and and her beauty. The jewelry and her dress is just it's just amazing. And that's why I pointed on this, putting it on in a mask. Let's move over to this this painting here. Thanks to Philip Longyearling, you were able to borrow this, you know the original uh, portrait. Tell us a little bit about this work. I mean, my work next to the original. This is a kind of yeah. An ongoing dream. Mm -hmm. um, because I want to show that my work is something like kind of different thing. I mean, look at her dress, this floral pattern. There are a lot of things uh, going on, and I really try to uh, focus on that and create a mask with a kind of very symmetric pattern. And she was literally sure, absolutely, absolutely spectacular. Very, very beautiful. Volker, I'd like now to talk about this painting here with the wig. You paint a lot of portraits of people in wigs and they look completely ridiculous, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, wigs were a very important part for representation. I think Louis XIV invented him because he lost his hair <laughs> and he thought, okay, this is quite bad, uh, so I'm wearing wigs. And literally, I forced everybody else to, to wear wigs and they were not even allowed to enter the court without a wig. And they were so expensive that some people really had problems. So it's, it's a serious thing. And what I even do now is like, I, I exaggerate in that way that I'm, I let them grow over the whole face. And this uh, being kind of funny, it's, I always say that humor is a sharp knife because you can uh, insecure certain positions quite well by, you know, exaggerate the week. And all this kind of self-confidence of a like an unquestioned male situation is now questioned because it looks totally ridiculous. Maybe we'll stop talking and see if anybody's managed to hear enough to ask us any questions. We yeah. have a question saying, what are the main differences between digital art and physical painting? Um, painting is a completely different technique. It, it, it uses like uh, yeah, paint, brushes, canvas, 
it has um, completely different needs and um, completely different surfaces. And digital art is a work on a computer, and then you have the file, and then you have to think how can this file be trans transported into the world, like a uh, photoprint, for example. Then you have the surface is completely different. The whole approach is completely different. And I always um, try to find in my works that the originals are paintings and my works are photo works. Um, I don't want to imitate the painting, and that's why I choose, for example, a certain paper which has a flat surface. I don't want to imitate some kind of canvas surface. And they all have this white border around it because this is the kind of classical photo issue. So uh, this, this change into medium, I will try to be uh, very transparent, and this is part of my work. And and printing is a very important part of the process, isn't it? How you know I can imagine getting a getting a accurate in terms of the color must be incredibly complicated. And they are incredibly beautiful objects, these photographs. Yeah, this is uh, um, this is a kind of process in um bringing a photo into the world. Um, and this requires, for example, a lot of tasks. That you are, um, yeah, you're test printing, taking a look at this. What about the depth? Can we change something? And uh, this is the photo process, while painting is another process. Then you have uh, water or like oil or something like that, and you have canvas. It's a different process. So there are two completely different um, techniques, and they have completely different results. And one of the questions was, which do you prefer? Uh, this is a me question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't prefer, no, I don't, yeah. I, I really love to paint and I really appreciate uh, what's possible uh, with painting. And I can't achieve what I do with Photoshop, for example, I can't achieve with a painting. So they're, they're, they have nothing in common. This is so far that when I'm, in my studio, and uh, I started with a painting, I can't switch to Photoshop. Because, uh, or, or if I started with Photoshop and I go to painting, I always think I can go one step back, which is possible in, in Photoshop. You can like, no, this was not nice, go back. Press the reverse button. Yeah. But in painting, you can't do that. And this is such a different attitude in your head, and a different thought that I can't do them on the same day. Yeah. Although, you know, you might say that painters, when you look at the, um, when you look at underdrawings, you know, quite often, there's a lot of, um, a lot of changes, sentimenti that are called by art historians. Yeah. Um, and then, and then you, you, you compare the image, the final painting with an, a, 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 an infrared ref reflectograph of the underdrawing, and you do see yeah. that changing process. Yeah, yeah, of course they change because there's a long process in, in, in painting. Yeah. But if you made it all blue, you, it's kind of hard to change it back. So you have to put a new layer on yeah. top, but you can't remove it like with the one button. Yeah. So uh, it's a it's a, a different approach to, to, to yeah. art. Yes, and I guess there's also a kind of more philosophical question, which is in you know since photography was invented, um, you know that you know some people question you know. Both realism in in oil painting. Yeah, we can do that with photographs. So why bother doing painting? I mean, I don't actually subscribe to that. I think there's no, a lot, a lot of really rather wonderful, yeah. um, you know, so-called naturalistic or realistic painters today. But um, but you know, I think people have talked about that, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a serious topic in this discussion. And um, but I always say, if you are standing in front of the painting, you have you have the surface. And if it is some kind of light change, and then you see that the surface is not flat, yeah. and then you have the smell, and and all these kind of they are totally unique for paintings, and I really love that. But I love this kind of uh, photo works, and I can achieve my I can I can tell my thoughts about some things only through this, and so I use it as a tool. As a, um, but I love them both.
Are there any more questions? Yes, there's one that I would absolutely love to know the answer to. Is there one thing in particular that always attracts you to a historical portrait? Like the one thing that I'm jumping on, um, yeah, I'm addicted to patterns. I mean, I, I really, you see, if you're sitting in front of one work, it's 19th century, but I, I love to paint patterns and I love to work with pattern, patterns in my um, uh, hidden portraits. So this is really like, this triggers me really. It's really like if I see uh, a portrait with a beautiful pattern and a fabric or even in the background, um, you got me. <laughs> Yeah, and this is a pastel, isn't it, rather than an oil painting? Yes. And does that require a different technique with your Photoshop to yes. pick up? Because you must be picking up the, the brush strokes or the yeah. strokes of, of, of a crayon. It's a complicated process. And sometimes um, I thought about it a lot, how I can, can uh, work with Photoshop and pastel and I know how to work with pastel in reality. So what I do now is I put like 10, 20 layers, and then each layer has kind of transparency. Yeah. So, and you, I did it here, and at the end, you can't see it, but I do like really like a lot of layers, and then I have 20% transparency, like 40 transparency, and you get this kind of blurred lines. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another way of creating your pastel without using really pastel. That's so interesting because that's basically what old master oil painters did, didn't they? With glazes. Yeah. They were building up the layers um, with sometimes very transparent glazes, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. And I do exactly this with Photoshop. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, because sometimes, because I want to be plausible, I don't want to destroy these works, and I have to think, okay, how did this paint on this? Uh, and what 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 is um, what character in, in painting? And I'm not an art historian. I see it from from uh, from a viewer slash painter. And um, then I try uh, to find ways and a technical way um, to um, to make my interventions plausible as plausible as possible. And that's why these works look like 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 true, like they are like that. They it's really kind of, it's a kind of plausible second version. They really do. I encourage anybody who hasn't looked at all of um, the images on, on Volker's website to go and have a look at them. And hopefully on, on James Freeman Gallery website as well, um, where you could buy one of these uh, very, um, you'd be very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so we have two other questions. Yes. Um, one is to what extent is it important to see the original artwork rather than just the image? And then the other question, which may roll into this, is what is the importance of the eyes? Okay, question one. Um, the, the material I'm using, like the original, if I call it material, they are spread over the world. So it's, um, it's quite hard to get them in, in, in reality because they are everywhere and I'm not a kind of traveling person. But um, every time I'm in a city where I know that some of my friends are hanging in the original, I go there and visit them. And um, it's always a kind of shock that you're seeing a kind of old friend and you, you know, your heart is bumping like, hmm, I know this, you know, because you're, you're, you're working so long with these works and they're really, that's why I call them friends. And it's important for me, but it's not that I start uh, worldwide travel to desperately seeing them. It's always like if there's a possibility, I definitely try to catch them. The second question is, the second question is what is the importance of the eyes in these yes. portraits? The eyes are important, but from my perspective, they're for us more important than for them in the back days. For us, it's totally important uh, to look into the eyes and we try to get contact with the people through the eyes. So for our view on the eyes, it's very important. I'm not sure whether this was uh, the case in the earlier days, because I see sometimes kind of empty views and empty cases. And um, I think that uh, for them, it was not that important to be shown like, I as 
the entrance door into your soul or something like that. I think this is a kind of newer door. And, um, and sometimes I hide uh, also like eyes completely because I think they are not important in this work. Because I think, no, you know, Greek bars, it's important. I think I don't think they are important for this work. There are other things that are more important. And it, I it emphasizes this kind of lack of agency that these figures have, this sort of lack of power. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and when I start to focus them by putting like, like, uh, like one eye peeking out or something like that, this we recognize immediately that the case is changing mm -hmm. and that the focus is changing. Mm -hmm. But I think this is our, um, the history of our um, uh, visual world today. Well, thank you very much to both to Polka and very much also to James, James Freeman Gallery and, and to Philip Mould again. Um, for, for making this show possible and um, for chatting to us today.